Here in the Himalayas, we may be far from the causes of climate change, but the effects are all around us. The glaciers are melting, the temperatures are rising, and although you can't see it, there's about 45% more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere just now than there was when human civilization first developed. Climate change is just one of the ways in which our presence on Earth is profoundly altering the planet. In this new series of Earthrise, we'll be exploring how to counter some of the greatest threats to survival, including pollution, loss of habitat, drought, and overconsumption. From the mountains of the Himalayas to the Australian outback and the hot springs of Iceland, we'll be looking at the impact of these global issues at the local level. We'll be bringing you stories of adaptation, innovation, and action from the people who are rising to the environmental challenges that we face today. This is Earthrise. Water covers two-thirds of the surface of the Earth. Less than 3% is freshwater, and most of that is frozen in glaciers and polar ice caps. This leaves less than 0.01% readily accessible for all the planet's freshwater needs. But the supply of this vital resource is under threat from pollution, mismanagement, rising demand, and climate change. In just over a decade, it's estimated that the world will only have 60% of the water it needs, unless we work harder to conserve it. I'm Russell Beard and I've come to Ladakh in northern India, where some engineers have come up with some innovative solutions to alleviate water stress in mountain communities. And I'm Amani Zain in Jordan, where women are taking the water crisis into their own hands. Millions of people rely directly on glacial meltwater for survival. But due to climate change, these reservoirs in the sky are disappearing at an alarming rate. Some scientists have predicted that by the end of the century, much of the Himalayas could be practically ice-free. Here in Ladakh, which experiences only 50 millimeters of annual rainfall, glaciers have been the life source for centuries. But due to climate change, over 14% of the local glaciated area has been lost in the last 50 years. I'm here to visit an engineer who's come up with a beautiful and extraordinary way of preserving the glacial water using monuments made of ice. In the town of Leh, I meet Sewang Dolme, a local environmental scientist. I understand that you are a bit of an expert about uh, climate change and the effects on mountain communities. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a sense of some of the challenges that they're facing here in Leh? The main crisis is that you have a mm -hmm. carbon glacier. Is that what we can see yeah, right yeah, there? Yeah, that's carbon wow. glacier. And that's where 80% of the water is coming for the Leh residents. And that glacier is receding at a very fast rate. And every family in Leh has a guest house and uh, they drain groundwater like anything. If there is no glacial water to recharge the groundwater, then of course there will be water crisis. You will see people, you know, fighting over water. Literally? Yeah, literally. The situation is getting worse by the day. Almost a billion people are affected by shrinking glaciers throughout the Himalayas. In nearby village Fiang, farmers are on the front line. Sonam Dolma and Funchuk Anchuk have been working here for more than 40 years. Thank you. Oh, Sonam, thank you so much. Thank you, Chili. OK, so cheers. Have you noticed any changes, perhaps with the seasons or with the levels of water? Mm -hmm. 
inna tsapa yon khamata luzna kangri metkana chachak tsarche san chachak tezuk shichana daksengati riul i phyang tsokskun la qaspo chacheno chipie mashan tiskala chachan chezna kangri metpa yang chikmane mana khongni na chesk qaspo chacheno ati chipie shanta qaspo chacheno here in the region of Ladakh, the population relies heavily on the Indus River. But with the situation getting dramatically worse, a local engineer, Son Nam Wanchuk, has stepped up to the challenge of helping the villagers adapt to these changes. In January, February, nobody needs water, so the streams flow and go into the Indus and into the ocean. Whereas in April, May, everybody, all plants, all humans are all dying for water. Yeah? And then there's acute shortage of water. What ice stupa does is by using winter water, storing it in the form of ice, and it melts exactly when there's this acute shortage. That spring problem is solved using winter water into ice that melts in spring, and then you're set. At the Environmental Mountain School he founded in 1988, Sonam has been refining and teaching his ice stupa concept for the last two years. Way, the pipe brings water, and then it falls down and becomes a stupa, right? You know, next 40, 50 years, the people who will be running this world are now in schools and colleges. I want to engage them in these uh, innovative ways to be sensitive towards the environment in the mountains so that then the earth could be in safe hands. And before we go to the ice topa, we'll see a little demonstration of how it is formed. Huh? Now that, suppose, is the mountain. Hmm? And that bucket there, is say the stream. From the lake or the stream, water comes in the pipe, which is underground, but here you can see, and there's pressure in the pipe. And then it comes like this. So you can see small droplets, which means water is exposed to the minus 20, minus 30 air, loses its heat and freezes. There is no moving part, there is no electricity, just gravity. That's the beauty of it. Good. Thank you. We're heading up to the ice stupas further up in the mountains, but first we have to make a quick stop. Oh God, okay, what have we got into here? They use these for the ice stupas to help the ice form. So this is a kind of vital part. It's like the skeleton of the stupa, if you like. I'll go and give them a hand, right? Okay. It's my contribution. <laughs> there it is. Wow. Never seen anything like that before. This is... Huh? <laughs> now I understand. You know? It's quite... An, oh, it's a bonkers idea. It's quite, it's quite crazy, really. <laughs> the design of the stupa is critical for its success. It must have a minimal surface area to provide a maximum protection from the sun. This enables it to last long into spring, sometimes up to four months. If the same volume of ice was a flat glacier, it would melt within days. This dude's climbed the top with his crampons and ice axe, and he's thrown down this rope, and he's just pulling them up piece by piece and just adding them to the pile. The prickly buckthorn is added all the way to the top of the stupa. The water catches onto the thorns, making it easier to crystallize in the cold weather. 
And yeah. when you see the size of it, you really understand how that could have a, a significant impact yeah. for irrigation. Yeah. What do you reckon the volume of water is there? Two million liters. Two mm. million liters, yes. At the bottom of that tunnel, really in the heart of the ice stupa, is this large pipe. And that's the one that's channeling the meltwater down from the glacier up on the mountain. It's coming down to the base of that pipe, and because of that head of pressure, it's forcing it 15 or 20 meters up into the air and psh, out into a sprinkler to coat the outer structure. It's quite spooky in there. <laughs> Sonam's vision isn't just about a handful of ice stupas in one mountain village, but hundreds of them protecting the entire Himalayas and helping irrigate fields and forests. 5,000 trees were planted in 2015 and are irrigated each spring with the water harvested from the ice stupas. He's already won global recognition for this project. What's the future for these guys? Where do you okay. see these going in the next few years? I see it going in two different directions, lower and lower, towards the people in the villages. Higher and higher, towards the highest parts of the valley, where you can grow many of them, chains of them. So our hope is we could re-glaciate what we have lost to buy time and adapt to changing climate. So we've just lost the sun over the hill there. It's getting cold very quickly, but we've got a plan. We've got Stanson and Thomas here, and they've uh, brought some prayer flags to tie up onto the top of these two ice stupas and we'll get a sense tomorrow morning how effective they are at creating these amazing structures. The water in the pipe is released overnight when temperatures reach minus 20 or minus 30 degrees. Oh, here it comes! Ah! Slowly building up these structures until they reach heights of 60 or 70 feet. Yeah! It's like a... Uh, Oil rig. Yeah. It's like you've struck oil, <laughs> but you've struck water, eh? The next morning, I return to the stupas to see the changes that have happened overnight. Oh, wow. Oh, man, look at that. That is fantastic, isn't it? Let go and see. I want to climb up it, but I don't know if that's a good idea. Let's see. If I get stuck, I'm going to make quite a nice addition to this sculpture. I'm just thinking they're going to come back tomorrow and find me in here. <laughs> Bearing in mind the whole reason that they're doing this is to try and conserve that winter meltwater. It's like a kind of water battery. They charge it up in the winter and then it melts in the spring. We are losing our glaciers almost for no fault of ours. Life would not have been possible at all in this desert had it not been for those glaciers. Because it had this fossilized water from tens of thousands of years ago, we are able to survive. And if they are gone, we'll be gone. And it will be a real desert with no life. People in big cities, if they lived simply, then people in the mountains mm. could simply live. Yeah? Mm. And uh, sooner or later, it will come to their own uh, doorsteps. Mm. So we should be sensitive to see the first signs mm. and mend our ways. Around the world, sources of fresh water are dwindling and drought is spreading. The investment bank Goldman Sachs has called water the petroleum of the next century. Yet, it's already fueling tension. On the Indus River system, new dams built by India are seen by rival Pakistan as a threat to national security. Within India, anger boiled over in Bengaluru in 2016 when the Supreme Court ordered the state of Karnataka to release water from the River Calvary into Tamil Nadu. And water's become a weapon of war in Iraq and Syria. By 2025, 
two-thirds of the world's population could be living with water shortage. Conflict over water may be closer than you think. Jordan is one of the driest countries in the world, with less water per capita than almost anywhere else on Earth. Climate change, population growth and politics have put an already strained water supply under further stress. With the country recently suffering from its worst drought in 900 years, it is now estimated to only have enough water reserves to support two million people, yet it has a population of over six million. With faulty pipes and plumbing contributing to the crisis, I'm here to visit a scheme which is putting women at the heart of efforts to combat this growing issue. Water is severely rationed in Jordan. I meet water expert Dr. Raed El Tabini at one of the wells in Mafraq, where people come to buy more water. So, Dr. Raed, this is where people come when they run out of water? Yes. This is the main well here, the groundwater. So these guys, are they going to sell the water to, to, to people, or is this for them? Are they buying it now? Yeah, Can but I some... Ask them? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. How are you? This means that there's 15 families ask him to bring the water for them, 15 families a day. Wow. What we get for a day is 60 to 80 liters, which is equal to a shower time on average somewhere else in the world. This is well below the threshold defining water stress, and it's due to drop further in the coming years. So this is normal. People run out of water yeah. and they need to come In Jordan, uh, we live with the run out of water every day. Why is the situation so bad? With the Israeli, with the Syrians, you know, there is issues when it comes to water share. We cannot live without water. I think personally, the coming war in the region will be about water. According to one study, the kingdom's supply of fresh water was on track to be exhausted as early as 2060. To make matters worse, around 50% of the water distributed to houses across the country is lost through illegal tapping and faulty pipes. But a practical solution to these water issues has been developed in collaboration with the Jordanian government. It's known as the Water Wise Women's Initiative. This course teaches women water-saving techniques and plumbing skills and is supervised by ex-graduates. The ladies are being taught what happens if there's a faulty tap. All the parts of the tap need to come out in order so then they can go back in order so the plumber can check them one by one. Astonishingly, the total loss to leakage annually is at least 76 billion litres enough to satisfy the needs of 2.6 million people. I am reattaching the inlet into the tap, and I've got to make sure it's very secure. OK, so that's tight enough. OK, good. Oh, good. Good, well done. Thank you very much. <laughs> no. Good. Hello. So what made you want to go on a course? Women are specifically being trained because in traditional Middle Eastern culture, the husband must be present before a male plumber can visit. <laughs> being able to fix the problem themselves saves them both time and vital water. With 3,000 women around the country learning from this scheme, this initiative is making a big difference. Some of the qualified water-wise women have got a job fixing the plumbing at a local mosque, and I've been invited to join them. A little piece of metal is broken into the tank, and it's contaminated the water. So they've got to make sure that every drop of contaminated water is out of the tank before they refill it with fresh water. How long have you been a plumber? Since uh, October 2015. Okay. I love it because it's really, really helpful, and you can save something really expensive to us. It's the water. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Welcome back. Yeah. The imam of the mosque is just checking that everything's done. Bad, huh? But um, I don't think he'd know. These ladies know. 
With the water tank on the roof signed off, it's time to head inside to complete the job. So we're basically in the ablution room where people come and perform, they, they wash before they pray. And the ladies are going to show me how to attach these to the tap and they don't waste as much water. This helps conserve water. Because it's small, it's hard to... Yeah. You have to focus. Oh, God, I've lost my screen. <laughs> <laughs> Failed at the first hurdle. <laughs> it's very embarrassing. When you go to people's houses and sometimes do you find maybe some men who kind of don't like <clears throat> that there's a female plumber yeah. who's come to their home? What do you say? They just say, just try us and uh, see if we can do it or not. Just give us a chance. When they see we are really uh, self-confident with this, they look at us like, uh, oh my God, maybe she can do it. <laughs> yeah. so, okay, let's see. Wow, yeah, it works. Oh no, you see, I haven't done it very well. It's leaking from the top. So yeah, that is not. Okay, so okay, I think I need to stop now and let the professionals take over. <laughs> the work the water wise women are doing is even more important now, considering the impact the war in neighboring Syria is having on Jordan. Around two million refugees are being hosted in the country, increasing the rate of groundwater depletion. Just 15 miles from Mufraq is Zatari refugee camp. It's huge. It's like a little city. And there's 80,000 Syrian refugees living here, which is putting an incredible strain on Jordan's water supply. Getting water to the people living here is a massive logistical operation and carefully controlled. With no pipe network, 58 trucks like this one distribute water daily to 12,000 tanks in the camp. Almost getting full. But when the water runs out, that's it. From technical point of view, we have a bank account here that is not being recharged effectively. So it's like we are withdrawing every day, but then we are depositing very little. Ensuring the Syrians manage their water rations is vital. Ashraq Mashakba is one of the camp's water promoters educating the refugees on how best to conserve their water. The water here for Jordan, it's, uh, the quantity is so small. So they need like an awareness session for them to improve their usage for the water. These awareness sessions to help refugees cope with limited supplies are held here daily. احنا وجودنا اليوم ودعيناكم واهلا وسهلا فيكم حابين نعمل جلسه عن موضوع ترشيد استهلاك المي في المخيم. إنه في كمية معينة لكل فرد في توزيع في في محددات للتوزيع في كمية لكل فرد هي خمسة وثلاثة. It's just women here, Ashraq. So what, why is that? Because they are the, the let's say the core for the family. They are responsible for everything. Learning the best way to manage their water ration is vital for these women. It's great. It's really good, the work that they're doing here. They're really trying to kind of reinforce this message of how important water is and how, how much we need to conserve it. One refugee has been on the Water Wise Women's course. I meet up with Safa Sukriya, who is now one of the initiative's most successful women. She's set up her own business and employs five other female plumbers. إنه أنا أجيت من الشام عنا مي نحنا كتير هني كيف أنا أول ما أجيت إنه صرت دق على الجيران وين المي خلصت المي ولي إيه ما أنت خلصتيها خلاص ما في مي استني للأسبوع الجاي هلا أنا شرطي لأولادي يعني بس يجي يفتح المي لا ماما نمسو لا كذا فأنا شرطة المياه في البيت for Safa water education is essential. نا دولة فقيرة فالمفروض إنه يعني يكون في وعي كافي لازم okay. يكون في حلقات تواصل بيننا وبين هون إنه نعمل لهم حلقات توعية مبادرات إحنا عم نحاول يعني عم نعمل جهدنا. It's clear that water shortages across the globe are driving people to find creative and sustainable solutions. New designs, such as this mesh-like structure in Ethiopia, are converting air droplets to drinking water. 
Other devices are looking to the power of the sun to help solve water issues in countries like Ecuador and Ghana. Until the underlying causes are addressed, water scarcity will continue to spread. Yet innovations like these provide hope that we can adapt in the meantime.